Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Cherry Shots to the Cranium. I'm your host, Stephen Goforth. I am so excited to have as my guest today, Eric Redbeard, a.k.a. Eric Rowan from WWE. We have a fantastic conversation about so many different things. Number one, his debut with Universal Championship Wrestling. We also talk about his upcoming match at the UCW show with Carlito, his time with Luke Harper as a tag team, his time with the Wyatt family, his match with The Rock at WrestleMania, the Bludgeon Brothers angle that he had with Luke Harper, his run with Daniel Bryan, and he also talks about the passing of Luke Harper, a.k.a. Brody Lee, the first time he's really sharing his feelings on the death of Brody and uh, and how he handled that and how he is handling that and how it affected him. And also talking about the future of Eric Redbeard. What is in store for Eric? What does he have coming down the pipeline? You don't want to miss this wonderful interview Tremendous talent in the business of professional wrestling, and it was an absolute pleasure to speak with him. So without further ado, let's jump right into the interview with Eric Redbeard, a.k.a. Eric Rowan. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today is one of the most athletic and talented big men in professional wrestling. He's won multiple tag team championships. He was part of one of the most popular and successful factions in professional wrestling history, He experienced tremendous success as a singles wrestler, and he's considered one of the most dominant wrestlers to ever step foot in a ring. Please welcome the powerful and impressive Eric Redbeard, also known as Eric Rowan. Eric, how are you today, man? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me. Pleasure's all mine. You're going to be joining an outstanding roster of UCW, Universal Championship Wrestling. Your first match with the company will take place on Sunday, September 12th in Greenville, South Carolina at Summer Slamboree. You'll be joining other UCW superstars such as UCW Heavyweight Champion Carlito and The Awakening, formerly known as The Ascension in WWE. How did you hear about UCW and and what are your thoughts about joining this exciting promotion? Um, I'm I'm friends. uh what with uh the former ascension uh the awakening um who, who are going to be on the show and uh me and ryan connor used to ride together a lot on the road uh so he kind of put me in touch uh um, with this particular promotion uh which he seemed excited about and i usually go off his judgment when you're close with somebody so uh um they gave me an option to to, to come in and uh like you said there's uh guys like carlito who uh i've never got a chance to uh get in the ring with uh so you know it sparks my interest well i know ucw and its owner ron gossett are extremely excited to have you on board you mentioned carlito he's a universal heavyweight champion you'll be wrestling him on the show on september 12th tell me about your thoughts with your matchup with carlito you said this will be the first time you guys have been in the ring together one-on-one um yeah um you know he's obviously a tremendous athlete and talent his own right uh you know i I never uh think about who i'm working the day of unless it's announced quite frankly because uh i like to just think that i like surprises i guess you know sure and uh, so i try not to dwell on it too much but uh you know it's it's carlito and i'd I'd love to smash an apple over his head i don't know why uh but uh (laughs) But no, I'm I'm excited uh, for the chance to debut with UCW and uh, um, make a statement against Carlito, and I think it'll be a, a fun mesh of styles. Well, let's take a trip down memory lane for a second. Talk about your career. You've accomplished so much in your career. You debuted around 2003. Around 2007, you took your talents to Japan. What experiences did you have early on in your career that shaped you into the wrestler you feel you are today? Man, I I think it's a a combination of everything, like, uh, and always having the attitude of wanting to uh, improve myself. And, you know, that's with everything in my life. So it transfers to wrestling as well. Um, Never settling uh, for what you have and always striving to want more. So, you know, you, I started to train um, in some little tiny gym, and I wanted more, so I went and trained with Eddie Sharkey even after I trained uh, because I wanted him to be my trainer, you know. And right. then from there, I got a chance to go to Japan and live in the dojo and, uh, you know, stay there for three months and do the tours there and, you know, absorb everything and try to get better. And then you kind of 
go back on the Indies and you're not traveling all over. You're stuck in one place. I was a single father at the time. It's really hard to, you know, leave every weekend to go wrestle when you, when you, when you got one, you know, kid to take care of by yourself. It's, it's just not, you don't have that support group to help you. And, uh, but then, you know, you get developmental and you're working around, you know, people and learning and absorbing and then getting on the main roster and learning and absorbing and just continuing to learn and absorb, you know, you still learn and absorb this, the, the beauty of, you know, any kind of business that has to do with art, like you're constantly learning and pro wrestling is an art form. Uh, so you're, you're always learning, you're always learning something new and you can learn something new from anybody. And if, if you close yourself out and try not to learn, then, uh, you're just going to be miserable. Oh, a miserable agree artist. Yeah, agree yeah. 100%. Agree 100% on that. You always got to be evolving, right? Of course. Well, let's fast forward a little bit to 2011. You signed with FCW, which is Florida Championship Wrestling at that time. And that was a developmental territory at that time for WWE. And, of course, later became part of that rebranded NXT in 2012. What were your feelings on uh, FCW transitioning into NXT during that time when you heard about it? I mean, it was, it was difficult for people. Uh, I mean, we, we had FCW and Dr. Tom Pritchard was the trainer there. And then in comes the new trainer and Bill DeMont. And then came the changes with the, the NXT and um, from FCW. So it was just a lot of different changings of the guards. Uh, but like I said, you have to evolve and, uh, you know, and learn and uh, be open to that. But, then yeah, you also have to trust in yourself uh, and what you're capable of because there can be lots of cooks in the kitchen that kind of mess with you too. Uh, sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a it was a crazy hectic thing where you know nobody knew who was in charge, what was going on. Uh, it was it was it was it was crazy to think about. There's so many different moving parts happening, and then what it became, and then you know just the formation of the Y family and you know, getting that run on the main roster. I mean, it was just a crazy whirlwind that happened pretty quick after that. Well, that leads me in my next question. Of course, the Wyatt family was formed, of course, consisting of yourself, Luke Harper and Bray Wyatt. When you guys came together, did you ever think that the Wyatt family would be as successful as it was and, and make such a gigantic impact on the wrestling world? I think, I think after we uh, filmed those uh, vignettes, for the main roster and then the whole look and the, the pre-match entries and the way the crowds responded to us. And we kind of, we kind of felt we were, we were much different than anything else that had been seen at that point, you know, within yeah. uh, wrestling. So, you know, we, we always had a sense that it was, it was something special. Where did the idea come from for you to wear the sheet mask? Because you were the only one you know, in the group to wear that. Where did that idea come from? So before I was even part of the Y family, we were doing uh, lots of different uh, promos and um, stuff, you know, in front of Dusty Roads and um, on our promo days with developmental. And, you know, I had been doing uh, a, a Viking gimmick. So I came out with reindeer fur, drinking out of horns and cutting promos on, you know, being the man from the north. Uh, right, right. And, uh, they told me, you know, to try to change it a little bit. They want me to do some promos with uh, this group with uh, that that Bray was trying to do. Um, so I remember one day Bray bought, bought me, brought me like maybe like four or five different masks. And he was like, just try this to promote it. I was like, okay. One was like a, a clear mask that I that had makeup on it um, that I cut like half the mask off. So it would, show my beard another one was a clown mask that was like half a clown mask um one of them was a sheet mask one of them was a um a mask with uh um like a pig type thing mm -hmm. so you know every day i'd try like i'd come out with pajamas and wearing a mask and it, it would be it would it would be a promo with like those two or uh rick victor or just different people or with with Brody and we would just do different things that I'd be a different character every week using either one of the masks or whatever and it to me it was always a playoff of like uh 
tiny or leather face, you know, from devil's rejects or uh, right. Texas chainsaw and just that, that weird outsider. And, uh, um, cause I always found those characters interesting to my, to me. And I, I'll never forget. I remember, um, wearing these masks and dusty told me to take off the mask because my face was ugly enough because, <laughs> you know, he's, he, he was basically portraying that, you know, um, I have a unique look um, and yeah. professional wrestling. Um, I look scary. I, and I don't need I don't need the mask to look any more scary. Uh, right. Fast forward. Fast forward. Um, I debuted it with the Wyatt family on the NXT and we started to become what we were. We got called up to main roster. Well, in the trunk of my car, I still had those masks. And I don't know why, but that sheet mask stood out to me and I brought it with uh, during the day of shooting just because on a whim, like if they wanted to use it. And ever since it became part of the character. Of course, you formed that impressive tag team with Luke Harper and you just took the tag team division by storm. Whose idea was it to put you guys together and be such a dominant tag team? And, and what vision maybe did you guys have for your team? So it's it's funny because yeah, I, I go back and to I think about when we first started um, taking together, and we we started taking together when Bill Demont came on, and he just put us together. He, I don't think he had any ideas to put us with with Wyndham, but he just wanted us together. He liked that that look of us together and then just fast forward to the main roster. And then we were already with Bray and then we needed something to do and we could work as a tag team or singles. It didn't matter. Um, so yeah, just the powers that be liked us together, like the way we gelled together. And, uh, as you know, you could, as you can tell from just as time went by, we, we grew more and more as a tag team, you know, obviously as time went by, did you guys have any thoughts? You just you, did you guys sit down and talk together and say, "Hey, let's do this," or "I'd like to do that," or "No, nah, let's not do this. Let's try that." Uh, more more towards uh, when the Bludgeon Brothers. I think then you know because when uh, the our, the first run was happening and we were with the Wyatts and then we got put back together, we we wanted uh, to be singles wrestlers. We wanted to have character development with with individuals and everyone's dreams to be world champion. And they kept putting us together. And I think we butted heads a little bit in the beginning. Uh, but, you know, by that Bludgeon Brothers run, uh, we, we just we just sat down and we said, you know, we work well together. Uh, let's make this work, you know. And that's when we started putting all our ideas together. I mean, I'll be honest with you. When you guys were the Bludgeon Brothers, that was re really exciting to me. I mean, in my opinion, you guys – just absolutely dominated the tag team division. I mean, realistically, when you look at you two guys, uh, you know, you don't, there's really no other team that could match up. I mean, how did you guys feel about it when you rebranded yourself to Bludgeon Brothers and that dominance that you guys put on display when you got in the ring together? I remember, I remember, I remember the first pitch meeting for it. They showed us pictures of what they wanted the Bludgeon Brothers to look like. And it was literally like the, I think I think it's almost exactly what carrying crosses wear right now. Uh, it's uh, like the the demolition leather like straps, like uh, you know, like um, look like suspenders around your you while you wrestle. And we both looked at each other like no. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I think that's I think that's when uh, you know I, I had a, I had a few friends that uh, designed some things, uh, Kim Della and Jason Baker, and I kind of had had them help. Um, put together a look based on like a uh, Norse mythology and different things just to make it more us and uh, you know, and help with the mask, the masks and stuff like that. So uh, it just all came together. Cause you know, we just didn't say yes, <laughs> but right. uh, one, one thing they, they made us have is they wanted us to have these mallets and <laughs> nobody wants to just walk out with these crazy looking uh, mallets, but luckily uh, my buddy, Jason, uh, Baker, he uh, put together um, these these really badass uh, looking hammers with uh, Norse uh, runes with their kids' names carved into them. So yeah, was, they, they was, were pretty it, badass. I agree it was with pretty you cool. On that. People always thought they uh, they they looked fake, but uh, they were they were they were like uh, twenty five pounds of solid wood. 
and oh, wow. you could you could swing them like a baseball bat, and they weren't padded. You had a very memorable WrestleMania moment with The Rock at WrestleMania 32. How did this match come about? And just tell me how you felt about being in that moment. Uh, so that happened like two days before. Yeah, we, we, I think we weren't doing anything, or maybe they were going to have us in the, the Battle Royale, like um, Andre the Giant Battle Royale. But mm-hmm. yeah, just two days before, they let us know what we were doing, you know? And, you know, first you hear a match, it's like, oh, cool. And then it's like, oh, it's like this, like, like okay. But, you know, for, for a moment, you know, it's, it's, it's cool uh, to be part of that. And, you know, the hundred and plus thousand people, you know, that's, sure. a, that's, 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 that's a, that's a, that's a cool moment. And I wish it was a, a regular match. Yeah. But would I have been in a position? Probably not. Did you guys talk to the rock in detail before that? Did you go over any plans? Just kind of wing it when you got in the ring. Oh no! I mean, I mean, it's a, it was a, it was a, you know, thing we we talked about, and you know, kind of went over a couple, couple, couple liners, and hey, how you doing? And yeah, just go out and do what you had to do. Where well, you went out on your own and you aligned yourself with Daniel Bryan at the Royal Rumble in 2019. Where did the idea come from to pair you up with Daniel? Uh, that's another thing. The the day I I um I got hurt uh at the SummerSlam in 2018, and that was uh the one of the last matches that the Bludgeon Brothers had. Uh, we were the champs versus New Day. I tore my bicep middle of the match. You know, I tell him at the end of the match, "Hey man, I'll I'll see you in, I'll see you in four four months." And he's like, "What?" Like, cause I knew, I knew it was, was torn during the match, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we leave and we ended up having to drop the belt to, you know, two days later, um, we had another match with today, like a no DQ and, you know, so I left and I was totally expecting to come back, uh, bludgeon brother and, uh, cause they weren't using him. And when I was gone and hurt and I was just, you know, re- recuperating rehabbing you know what you do when you get hurt that's your only vacation and you just start to get back on the road and the the day i get you know on the road i get cleared by the doctor and pulled aside to an office and yeah that's where uh i think brian james told me uh that i'll be with daniel brian from now on so it was just kind of thrust on me did you and Daniel have the ability to, you know, bounce ideas off each other and, and talk about your your new formation, uh, or was it pretty much just scripted from day one? Uh, I mean, it's it's they. I think it it kind of evolved, uh, kind of basically at that point. You know, I was I wasn't kind of like gonna sit by and just let them do things. I think they wanted me to like dress like him and cut my beard. And, I think that's when I started wearing my metal shirts because they, they, they took the, you know, the land masks away from me and they wanted me to wear like, you know, what Daniel was wearing. They wanted me to cut my beard to be short like his too. And I said, no, uh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, but yeah, that's when I started wearing all these different uh, metal shirts and things like that. Cause uh, you know, I, t- I told Daniel, I was like, we're not the same, but we need to have a common interest. And I said, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to wear these shirts because it's a way to show up personality. Cause I, I'm not always going to get this, this microphone time that, that he is, you know, cause mm-hmm. you know, you got a big guy and a small guy is usually the big guys, the, the protector. And, uh, luckily, you know, something evolved out of it for a little bit, you know, with, uh, the whole, uh, a- angle with who done it, uh, the Roman reigns where at least I got a little bit of character development out of it, but, uh, yeah, but that, that run was, was fun and it was interesting and it, and it led to something. So it, you know, in my, in my eyes, it, it, it worked, um, just a weird dynamic between us two. I wish we would have been able to do more. I wish I would have been able to show more personality during that, but I think it kind of made sense, uh, when I went off on my own. 
Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, your mic skills are, in my opinion, are very good. Of course, you, you never really had the opportunity to talk much, right? And when you did, I was very impressed. I was taken. I was like, wow, this guy's great. So, I mean, how did you, I know it had to be a struggle for you to just stand there and not say much. And then how much freedom you had whenever you were able to, to come out and have a microphone in your hand and, and show the world what you could do. Um, I guess it's, it's just funny. We, we don't, we don't do the writing and you can't, you can't write a microphone under your hand. Um, right. you, 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 you can, you can try to tell your character's story the best you can when, when, when you're, when you're told to be quiet. Yeah. And you know, if, if I'm going to be quiet, I want people to know that I, you know, I, what I'm kind of like outside the ring, what, what I, what my interests are, which is why I, I wore the masks. Cause like, you know, you could tell what kind of character I was without talking with, with the Wyatts when I wore the mask and I, you know, just my mannerisms I would do, you knew that something was off about me. I was a little kooky, something, something was going on. And then when I teamed with Daniel and they saw these metal shirts, people drew conclusions like all oh, this guy must like going to concerts, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's just little little things where you can't talk. How do you get people to know a little bit of your personality? So I don't think people really think about that sort of thing too much. But to me, it's always on my mind, just the little things. Uh, so when when you're given the opportunity to speak, it's just so much easier to get your point across uh, than having to do little nuances. Sure. Well, let's talk about that covered cage storyline. I know you've talked about it in the past before, and you mentioned that it, it – I think the original idea and correct me if I'm wrong here was supposed to be like a giant rat before it became a giant spider. What were your thoughts on that storyline? Did you feel like it was delivered the way you wanted it to be delivered? Uh, I hated it. Uh, I, I thought, I thought the storyline didn't need to happen. I thought the storyline for me would have been a good feud with somebody, yeah. um, especially coming off of me debuting back on raw, losing to Seth in a very competitive manner. Like I thought that that's all I needed uh, was just a story where I could speak and explain myself and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, right. But from powers that be thought it I needed I needed some sort of gimmick or cage or something. And uh, again, to me, it was a, a step back uh, because again, I'm telling a story without being able to speak. Uh, going back to uh, trying to tell a story with props. And to me, that was a step back um, from everything I'd done. So it was a uphill battle uh, trying to get anything out productive out of it, especially when they just have you in a series of, of, of get over matches where you're not really getting over anything except for this cage. And then to me, the payoff to the cage, they didn't want like, the same things i wanted to because they put it out for so long you have to have a payoff that's equal to how long you make people wait and to sure. me they totally you know ruined the payoff which you know you know who's blamed for for that the the writers the the people that, that do it now i think it I, th I think i was blamed for it and i i think i went into went, went into things about that in the past too but uh you know, I get hard on myself because I'm a performer. So, so yeah, I, I blamed myself in the beginning, you know, for, for not working. But, you know, that's just me. Well, a good performer is going to do that. I mean, you're always going to be your own worst critic, right? Oh, yeah. Of course, you know, we lost Luke Harper, a.k.a. Brody Lee, in 2020. I know this had to be extremely tough on you. Where were you when you heard the news about Brody's passing? I was uh, in my basement uh, watching Soul uh, with my little girl. So, of all the movies, I was I was watching that. Uh, yeah, man, it's it's hard uh, to lose, you know, somebody, and it affects you. And but on the other side of it you need to to look at other relationships in your life as well and you know it's not going to last forever uh, nothing's guaranteed 
Um, and you just need to surround yourselves with the people that you love the most and just let them know it every day um, and appreciate them and take everything in and, you know, live life like there's no tomorrow safely. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, I mean, it, it was, it was, it was devastating. Uh, you're on the road with these people, you know, and Brody in particular, you're on the road with them more than your families. And at such a young age, you know, it, it just blows my mind. It's like, it's, it's crazy. It's like just right after his 30, 41st birthday, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Do you still stay in touch with Bray? Did you guys communicate uh, right after this happened? Uh, we, we talked right after it happened, you know, um, it's, it's just, it's just one of those things, man. It's, it's tough for everybody and everyone, you know, reacts differently, uh, to loss. So there's just no, no words and every day stings the same. Um, and you try to keep busy, uh, with, with your own projects, you know, to, to make, to make sure that, uh, your, your mind keeps going, uh, but you never forget. And you always, you know, have that admiration and love. Eric, I know that had to be extremely tough. And, and as you move forward and as tough as that is, how do you, look towards your future what do you have in store for your career uh, as you try to move forward uh the future i mean no one's got a crystal ball you know uh i know what i'm i'm striving to do and i i have i have projects that i'm i'm working on currently um outside of the wrestling realm uh with acting um yeah one one of which is uh a film I did right after my release, Ghosts of the Ozarks, which is premiering at the Austin Film Festival come, um, I think it's October 23rd through 28th or something like that um, in Texas. Um, but that nice. will be the, the world premiere. Um, it's a movie I did uh, with director Jordan Wayne Long and Matt Glass. And um, it's, to me, it was a tremendous script and, that's a tremendous uh, film. Um, very, very talented people. Uh, Tara, Pay um, Tara Perry, um, Tommy, Tommy Hobson, Phil Morris, David Arquette, um, Tim Blake Nelson, Angela Bettis. Uh, they, they just transformed into these characters, and uh, I'm excited for people to to see this uh, this film. Um, but with everything that's happened this year too, um, it kind of strives you to, uh, to, to make things that you want it to happen, it happens, you know, and sure. to, to not sit and wait. So, you know, yes, I, I, I love wrestling and I still do it because I, you know, I love it, but you know, you know, you, you get a little bitter towards it and you you try other things and you gain a whole love and admiration for these things as well so you know you can look for me in uh in i think in both uh but right now i'm i'm really falling in love with acting well so the fans can uh, be reminded about your movie coming out or any other appearances you're going to be making especially one for ucw coming up on september 12th where can fans follow you on social media? Uh, they can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Eric Red Beard. Fans, go out there and follow Eric. Make sure you stay up to date. He's got a lot of exciting things going on as you hear. That's great about your acting career, man. That's fantastic. I cannot wait to see that. Oh, I'm, I'm excited about it. Uh, I, I tell you all about some other projects that I'm really excited about too, but uh, obviously for, uh, for, for reasons uh, um, of confidentiality, I cannot.
Sure. Yeah, that's totally understandable. Eric, good luck, man, with your debut with Universal Championship Wrestling on September 12th in Greenville, South Carolina. Tickets can be purchased through the UCW website at ucwtv.com. Again, that's ucwtv.com. You do not want to miss this outstanding show and see Eric in action. Eric, congratulations, not only on such a wonderful career so far in professional wrestling, but your new venture into acting. Man, the future is so bright for you. Thank you so very much for taking the time to, to come on the Cheer Shots to the Cranium podcast and just be my guest today. Thank you. Well, thank you. Pleasure was mine.